It takes a certain kind of ambition to do what farmers do. Between the hours and the hard labor, to the public scrutiny and bureaucratic maze running, it's not an easy task. While the agriculture industry feeds millions, quietly tilling and producing behind the scenes, many forget that our food comes from the hands of real people with real stories. Join us as we share stories from those with boots on the ground and unearth unique perspectives on agriculture's biggest conversations. It's time to grab your shovel and get to work. I'm Don Schaefer, and this is Digging In with UFA. In recent years, there's been increasing concern about what goes into our food. When it comes to cattle production, the use of antibiotics and antimicrobials at large can sometimes create pause with the consumer. How do we keep our animals safe while assuring the food is safe for the public? Today we dig into antimicrobials within cattle production. Life sometimes has a funny way of guiding you to places you didn't expect. The son of a cattle farmer, but far from interested in developing a career in agriculture. Our guest today could not have predicted that he would become the CEO of a cattle company of his own. Now with a look into his life, running one of the largest feedlot operations in Western Canada, here's Ryan Casco. My name is Ryan Casco. My family has a farm, Casco Cattle Company, located in southern Alberta. I'm the president of our company. Casco Cattle is a family-owned and operated farm, but we've grown beyond what some people might call a family farm. We have about 70 employees, and we have five different feedlot locations where we feed a total of nearly 50,000 cattle at one time. A large part of our business is we have about 6,000 acres of irrigated farmland. And so we're growing crops for our cattle, but growing crops for canola oil. We grow peas and beans and triticale and mint and dill and <laughs> various crops. I uh, am a little bit unusual in that in some respects, I'm a first generation farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm. My father was a cattle dealer, so he was involved in agriculture and I went to university. The last thing on my mind was getting involved in agriculture. It wasn't even on top of mind. You know, I thought I was going to be a big businessman or a lawyer or something like that and didn't realize that uh, agriculture is a quite significant business in southern Alberta. just didn't, didn't make that connection. And I had a co-op job working for an agricultural chemical company and was really fascinated by the agriculture industry. And when I finished university, we purchased a farm. So that was uh, 27 years ago. And since then, we've really put our hearts and souls into it and grown our business. And I just find it such a satisfying business to be a part of. Growing up on a dairy farm, you had to work. Thriving alongside your cattle and developing a hardworking skill set is just par for the course as a dairy kid. When deciding what she wanted to do when she grew up, our next guest leaned into what she knew best, maybe even what she was destined for by becoming a veterinarian. Looking out for the well-being of cattle and livestock, Joyce knows the necessities of keeping a healthy herd. Here to provide her expertise into all things antimicrobial within agriculture, this is Dr. Joyce Van Donkers Good. I'm Joyce Van Donkers Good, and I am an independent business person. I'm a veterinarian uh, specialized in advanced bovine medicine epidemiology. I'm a farm kid <laughs> from East of Cole, Little Alberta. My dad had a dairy till I was 11, and he went into cow calf, and then the land got too expensive for pasture, so then he went into feedlot. So I was a fortunate kid that I got to grow up, you know, being exposed both to dairy operation, cow calf and feedlot cattle. So I was always in the barn, you know, or with my dad in the corrals, hauling pails of chop, feeding calves, moving irrigation pipes. So working hard, that was a big thing with Dutch kids. You have to work hard. You know, when I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be a cattle vet. I love cattle and I like fixing problems. Some people think cattle are stupid. And cattle are not stupid. You know, none of us are Dr. Doolittle. I wish I could talk to animals <laughs> so they can tell me really what's going on. 
But cattle are actually very intelligent, and you can learn a lot by watching cattle. They actually tell you how they're feeling, how they're doing. I think to be a good producer or a good veterinarian, you have to respect the animals and you have to have empathy for them because they can feel everything like we can as a human. Their nervous system is as well developed as ours. You know, a healthy pen of cattle or get a brand new pen of calves coming in, a nice bunch of little black baldies. They're all eating at the bunk and they're all happy wagging their tails. It just makes you feel good. So antimicrobials is a broad term for any substance that will either inhibit or destroy bacteria or parasites or fungus or viruses. So it's a broader term than antibiotic. Antibiotic is more term restricted to substances that will either slow down the growth or kill bacteria. Antimicrobial is a broader category, includes antibiotics, but it also includes antivirals, antiparasitics, antiseptics. So it's just a bigger term to include more things. So if we, as either human doctors or veterinary doctors, are not responsible in how we prescribe antibiotics in particular, then misuse of them or inappropriate use or overuse can lead to the development of antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. And that means it's going to be harder to treat either a human or an animal with that particular product. And so it's a global matter because both human doctors and veterinary doctors have to work together with many other stakeholders, including producers like Ryan, to ensure we use antimicrobials or antibiotics responsibly. Because if we don't, we will get resistance development in bacteria that maybe it's common bacteria that can inflict both humans and animals, or it may be bacteria in an animal that may not cause disease in a human, but if that bacteria gets in the environment, potentially it can spread that resistance to other bacteria that may be of importance to humans or vice versa. Humans travel all over the world, right? We've seen that with COVID, how quickly something can spread. And animals, you know, we do import export animals. So you can transport bacteria that might be resistant to something and you can spread that resistance if you're not careful. So we all need to work together to reduce antimicrobial resistance to ensure that we have continued access to antimicrobials, but they also continue, most importantly, to work for us to keep both humans and animals healthy. How do we maintain adequate dosage and proper use of antimicrobials when raising cattle to avoid antibiotic resistance? Understanding that even Canadian public policy has deemed antimicrobial resistance is a serious public health concern around the world. So I have cowboys and cowgirls that will ride through the pens every day and they're assessing the cattle for their health. And at times there will be an animal that is showing signs of some type of a sickness. And in a case like that, we have worked with our veterinarians to develop a protocol. If we find a sick animal, we would take it to a central spot, our hospital, where we put them in a squeeze where the animal's contained. We check its temperature with a thermometer. We have a shoot side computer program to determine the sickness. And then if we determine that we need to give an antibiotic, we'll follow that protocol to figure out what we should give and how much to give. So that would include weighing the animal and determining how much of an antibiotic that animal would require. We do that because we want the animal to be healthy. So, you know, just like a, a human, if someone gets sick, we would treat them and, and monitor them and hope that they get better. So for a healthy food supply, we need healthy animals going into the food supply. And so it's critical for both the safety of the food that these animals are healthy going in. That's a basic requirement. The other thing producers like Ryan will do is every antibiotic we use, most of them have a meat withdrawal period. So for example, most vaccines have a 21-day meat withdrawal, which means after you vaccinate an animal, you can't ship it to slaughter for food production for at least 21 days. With various antimicrobials, those withdrawal periods could vary from one day all the way up to 60 days. It all depends on the particular drug and how it's eliminated from the animal's body. The important thing is that producers read the label for each product, whether it's a vaccine or an antimicrobial or a pesticide, and they follow those meat withdrawal periods 
or milk in the case of dairy cows before you ship the animal to slaughter for food production. If producers don't adhere to meat withdrawal periods, there is always the risk that if someone is very sensitive to the drug, for example, my dad was allergic to penicillin. And so if he would consume a meat product that was contaminated with residues of penicillin, you know, he could potentially get an allergic reaction to it. We call them violative drug residues, but these are residues that are higher than or permitted by Health Canada Veterinary Drug Directorate. They determine meat withdrawal periods based on the most sensitive individual to protect the public. So it is really important that producers follow those. If at a slaughter plant, the inspectors, for example, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, sees needle marks like injection marks in a neck that look recent, so there's some hemorrhage around that needle mark, they will actually pull that animal on a suspect line. They will take tissue samples from that neck injection. They will send it to their lab in Saskatoon, who will look for drug residues. Then the carcass is held till they get the results back. And if there are residues in that carcass that are not appropriate, the whole carcass gets condemned. So it doesn't enter the food chain. And then there is a follow-up by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to the producer to say, okay, what went wrong? Why did this animal enter the food chain? And that producer is going to have to explain and put in place corrective actions that that never happens again. Residues is only one part. The bigger issue is these superbugs. For producers, having this process in place is a failsafe. And in the rare occurrence where an investigation needs to take place, it's extremely serious. Rest assured, no farmer wants to be questioned by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And you'll hear from Ryan in a moment how seriously producers take their dispensing responsibility. But first, we head back to Joyce with more on bacteria resistance. I think one of the concerns that the public and consumers are concerned about is the use of antimicrobials in livestock, all livestock, and the possibility that we make bacteria in the livestock resistant to particular antimicrobials. And then if people get exposed to those bacteria, either through contaminated food or through contaminated water that they drink, or potentially direct exposure to the animals, like in a petting zoo or something. If that bacteria is resistant to an antimicrobial and you get exposed to it, and usually it means through your digestive tract, so you've consumed it one way or the other, that if that bacteria is a bacteria that can make you sick, then it will be harder for the human doctors to treat you with, say, they want to use the same antimicrobial that the bacteria is resistant to. It may not work as well. The other concern is bacteria are really smart, which is not good for us, but they like to share things. And so if one bacteria is resistant to an antimicrobial, these little guys, they like to sometimes share that genetic resistance with another bacteria. And so the concern is bacteria can share genetic resistance elements, and that also can increase, you know, exposure either of animals or humans to other bacteria that weren't initially resistant but they picked up genetic elements of resistance from another bacteria. And so that is another way you can pick up resistant bacteria. That's why it's important, you know, we only use antimicrobials when we need to. We use them in either the right human or the right animal at the right dose for the shortest duration possible. So kind of right bug for right drug at the right time, dose frequency. So we need to work together collectively because at the end of the day, we call it one health. What happens in the human health sector can influence animal agriculture and vice versa. What happens in animal agriculture can influence public health. Part of the success we will find in combating antimicrobial resistance lies in the relationship between veterinarians and cattle ranchers. Recognizing bad habits and improper distribution of antibiotics on the individual level will have lasting effects industry-wide. So as a veterinarian, the way we monitor antimicrobial use in our clients' herds is most veterinarians, they prescribe, you know, the use of the antimicrobial to their clients. So we have tracks of our veterinary prescriptions. We have dispensing records. We also keep track of the volume. So as a vet, I can make a prescription for a year for, you know, a large operation, say like a feedlot. But then we have so many refills that are allowed in there. 
and we monitor the declining balances and then we have set controls in there. So all of a sudden, if there is more use than anticipated based on historical usage, we're investigating why that is. And it is our responsibility to ensure proper use. And that goes all the way from, you know, training clients how to diagnose disease and creating those treatment protocols, as Ryan talked about, and then actually monitoring that the feedlot staff are following those protocols. There's a few different ways that we monitor our use of antimicrobials. Number one is that we have a relationship with a veterinary practice that is working with my team, if not daily, then at least weekly. So we have visits from veterinarians to come out and they're overseeing our treatments and educating our staff on how to apply things properly and record things correctly. But just internally, all of the cattle are brought to a location where we have a computer system where we scan a national ID tag that's in the animal's ear and uh, we can identify which animal is in the squeeze at the time and we record which drug and how much of the drug is being used. And that's our main way to track the volume that we're using and then that our veterinarian will oversee that when they come out and just make sure that everything looks correct. As a beef industry, as a feedlot industry, we have built a Canadian feedlot antimicrobial use and resistance surveillance program led by the National Cattle Feeders Association, Alberta Cattle Feeders Association, with Public Health Agency of Canada and the Beef Cattle Research Council. And so we started that in early 2018, got funding for that with support from the federal government and provincial government, Alberta government as well. And so now we actually participating vet clinics and participating producers provide information to the public health agency or CPARS, a division of that, you know, randomly selected lots of cattle on what antimicrobials we're using and also in general, what disease categories that use is for. So there is a program. It gives background information, you know, both to producers and veterinarians, but it is publicly available on what are antimicrobials? Why do we use them? This is what we're seeing. This is what we do to make sure we have responsible use. And then the Canadian Vet Medical Association also has created guidelines that I've been involved with and led for the beef sector for veterinarians on responsible use as well. Farming population that might be listening today and, and when they think of their relationship with the use of antimicrobials, that we have a responsibility to the public to share with them our production practices. And so people understand, because I think a lot of people either don't think about it at all, or, you know, if you were to ask general population what they think of the use of antimicrobials in livestock, people would say, no, I'm totally opposed to that. That sounds terrible. But there really is an important reason why we use it. And also what our responsibilities are for good use of these tools to keep cattle healthy and keep our food supply safe and healthy as well. And microbials, it is a privilege for us to use them. It isn't a right. And if we don't use them responsibly, that privilege can be taken away. And we have seen that in Europe where antimicrobials have been taken away from the livestock industry. So we just got to remember, you know, sometimes governments can make political decisions. And we see this sometimes more in the U.S. or in Europe where they take products away from producers and they forget about the health and welfare of the animals. And animals are just like humans. They can get sick. And so we need to be able to treat them. We see less new antimicrobials being developed for livestock production in particular because of this concern of antimicrobial resistance. And so that becomes an issue for us, which means as livestock producers and vets, what we currently have might be what we have for only for many years. And so they need to continue to work. And that is only going to happen if we use them responsibly. As we've heard, food safety starts with a healthy animal. Tune in to future episodes as we dig deeper into how antimicrobials and other inputs affect the food we eat. At the end of the day, we look to our resiliency within ourselves and our communities to make our collective futures as bright as possible. All it will really take is conversations like these, some vulnerability, and a little digging. 
thanks to the support of UFA Cooperative, we're able to share stories from those who live and breathe agriculture. We'd like to thank our guests for sharing their insight into the future of agriculture and for being with us today. For more information and a new episode every month, visit ufa.com. With listeners like you, we'll continue to dig a little deeper here on Digging In with UFA. I'm Don Schaefer. Thanks for listening. Another Everything Podcast production. Visit everythingpodcast.com, a division of Patterson Media. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. The views expressed in this podcast reflect opinions and perspectives from participating guests and not necessarily those of UFA, UFA Cooperative's membership, elected officials, or stakeholders.